Recently, we did a presentation on my top five tips for wilderness survival. Then we followed up with my top five guns for wilderness survival. Well, today will be part three in our three-part series on survival where I will beat this subject completely into the ground with my top five mistakes that people make on the subject of wilderness survival. And of course, before we get to the top five, we have to have a brief recap and we have to have some prerequisites. Now, when I say brief recap, I do mean very brief. I've discussed these things in depth in previous presentations. And I want to start with my definition of what I mean when I say wilderness survival, which is when you're in the field under adverse conditions and you have to spend the night or multiple nights when you had not intended to and you were not prepared to. Now, my top five tips for wilderness survival are one, proper prior planning prevents getting in the situation in the first place. Two, know yourself and seek self-improvement. Three, carry equipment commensurate with your knowledge and skill level. However, four, don't overpack. And five, get all your gear together and keep it in something that's easy to carry, like a jacket with a lot of pockets, a fanny pack, a small backpack. Get it all together and then carry that. Now, the prerequisites that you need to know before we get to the top five are, one, fair warning, just about all I'm going to do today is talk. Two, the subject of wilderness survival is a subject with which I consider myself to be familiar. I spent a lot of time in the military. I've done hunting trips, hiking trips, camping trips. I consider myself to be competent in this subject, but I do not consider myself to be the consummate subject expert. There's a lot of people that know more than I do. I know that because they constantly remind me about how they know so much more than I do. Third, as I discuss this, I am not going to be talking about statistics. I'm going to talk about the things that the crew and I have experienced, the mistakes that I've made, the mistakes that I've seen people make, the mistakes that members of the crew have made, the mistakes that they've seen people make. Some of the crew has actually done some work with search and rescue, I'm talking about the mistakes that they have seen people make that got those people in the position when they needed to be searched for, when they needed to be rescued. And finally, the top five will not be in any particular order, except I will save what I consider to be the worst mistake for last. So with that, let's get started. Before I even get to point one, I'm going to have to ask everyone to please remember that we're no longer in the third grade and not make fun of the way I talk. Okay, point one. I'm going to spend more time discussing point one than the other four points. I may spend more time on point one than the other four points combined, and there's some reasons for that. One being, it can be a little bit difficult for me to explain. Two, because it's a broad ranging topic. Three, because the people who are the first to make this mistake are very often the last to realize they have. And four, because although I do not consider point one to be the worst mistake people make, I do consider it to be the most common. And what is it? It's the mistake of believing that you have a trait or a characteristic or a talent or a skill that you just don't have. Or even if you do have a certain degree of skill on a given subject, it's the mistake of believing that your skill level is far greater than it really is. And this is a mistake that gets a lot of people in a lot of trouble. Now that might sound fairly straightforward, but I want to explain this in far more detail than I need to, but bear with me. Little children, I mean five, six, seven-year-old kids, very commonly believe themselves to know things they just don't know. They believe themselves to be able to do things that they just can't do. Good example, five-year-old kindergarten student. He's seen westerns on TV. He sees people ride horses. He just thinks he could do that. Then he gets the opportunity to go out to the farm where he's going to get to ride a horse. Oh boy, that sounds cool. And it turns out that what he's really doing is sitting on the horse, holding the saddle horn while an adult holds the reins and walks the horse back and forth. The kid is disgusted. He's disappointed. He thinks it's the dumbest thing he's ever seen because he thinks that if he were holding the reins, he could giddy up that horse all over the place. No, he can't, but he thinks he can. This is a very common trait among little kids. 
Now, most of the time, by the time kids are 10, 11, 12 years old, they've really started growing out of that. We all know that teenagers can be very overconfident in their abilities to do certain things, like drive. But if you put a 13-year-old kid behind the controls of a helicopter and told him, start it up and fly it, go ahead, he won't take you up on that because he knows that he doesn't know how. Little kids have the belief they can do things that they can't do. But sometimes kids don't grow out of that as much as or as soon as they should. Let me tell you an anecdote. I'm at a mountain man rendezvous, so we're cooking over the fire, shooting our muzzle-loading guns and so forth. Part of this is throwing tomahawks. Now, I'm fairly good at throwing tomahawks, but I'm not particularly skilled at teaching someone else how to do it. So I've got one of the crew with me. He's very inexperienced at this. I'm trying to work with him. We're muddling through. About then, a 12-year-old kid comes up and tells us we're doing it wrong and starts telling us what we should be doing. Well, right about then, the kid's mother arrives and tells the kid, and I think I can get the quote right, don't tell people how to do things when you don't know how to do it. To which the kid replies, actually, Mom, I do know how. So I hand the kid a tomahawk. Go ahead, show us how. Kid throws the tomahawk about ten times, never does stick it in the block, misses the block completely more often than, than not. And I then have to take the tomahawk back and tell the kid that, no, maybe you don't know how. This kid is a little behind the power curve of growing out of that belief that they can do all kinds of things. And that is something I see in people who consider themselves to be knowledgeable on the subject of wilderness survival. Now, bear with me while I go off on a tangent. There's a particular faction of our society, and they are described with a certain word. And what these people do, among other things, is they become fixated on a particular person, and they become obsessed with that person, and they drive by that person's house, and they call that person on the phone, and they send that person texts and emails, and they try to hack that person's email account and hack their phone. And we call these particular type of people stalkers. I'll get there. Now, different jurisdictions will have different laws, but basically there's a line. When the stalker is on this side of the line, they're annoying or comical. When they cross that line, they've committed a crime. And I am always amazed at stalker's ability to know where that line is and know just how to get right up to it without crossing it. It's as if they go to stalking school. There's some kind of app that you can use to call someone on their phone. And when I look at my phone and it reads a certain number, that's not the number that's really calling me that's a stalker using an app. I never knew such a thing existed, but all the stalkers know about it. It's as if on the day that someone raises their hand and declares their intent to be a creepy stalker, they are magically endowed with this amazing body of knowledge on the subject. Now, what does that have to do with wilderness survival? Because there are a lot of people who consider themselves to be knowledgeable on the subject that don't really know very much. It's as if the day they raise their hand and say, I'm going to be a wilderness survival commando, that they think they are magically endowed with all this knowledge, but they are not. And that gets a lot of people in trouble. Now, let me tell you an anecdote. I'm talking to a 16-year-old kid and we happen to be talking about this subject, and he considers himself to be very knowledgeable, and he makes the statement that in the woods he thinks he can get by with just a knife. And I did not perceive that he was trying to be boastful, and he really thought he could do that. Okay, and I asked him about his fire building plan, and his fire building plan is that he's going to, in the field, find a piece of flint, spark that on his knife blade, and build a fire. Okay, I have used flint and steel to start fires on a few occasions. I do not consider myself an expert on it, but I'm at least familiar with it. And I know that different types of steel are much better than others for making sparks. Like my Buck 119, I don't think that a witchy woman with sparks flying from her fingertips could get anything to spark off of this. I don't know what kind of knife blade that kid had, and I suspect he really didn't either. Now, 
I have used flint and steel to start fires, and I know that if I have just the right conditions and just the right tinder, and you give me a long time to do it, yes, I can do it. But if it were a dark, stormy night, I would not want to rely on my ability to use flint and steel. But the real thing is, in talking to this kid for about one minute, it becomes glaringly obvious that he has never done it. He's never done it what I call for real. And I don't mean in a survival situation. I just mean you're in the field, you caught some fish in the lake, and now you have to get a fire started to cook those or you're going to be eating sushi. You really do need a fire. He's never done it under adverse conditions like on a rainy day or in an environment where there's been a lot of rain for the last week and everything's wet. He's never done it under really good controlled training conditions. He's never done it in the dark. He's never even just gone into the backyard and given it a whirl. He has never done it, yet he's supremely confident that he can. This is the kind of mistake that I'm talking about. Now, an extension of that is believing that your skill level is far greater than it is. Okay. Let me tell you another anecdote. I do a lot of hunting and camping and hiking trips, and I did a lot of this stuff with this particular individual. And he did have a lot of skill when it came to fieldcraft. He really did. And he did have a lot of skill when it comes to building fires. Okay. Well, one day we're driving and we're going out into the field. And about the time we get there, he remembers that he has neglected to put any matches in his waterproof match container and asks me if I can spare any. And I told him, yeah, I have some, but the 20 in my waterproof match container, so I can spare some, but not all that many. He considers that no problem at all because I only need one. One. Well, okay, three. I can give you more than three. But he was insistent he would not take any more than three. Well, we didn't get into a situation that day where we really needed a fire. But to me, the idea that you only need to carry three matches is kind of silly. Now, this is back when we were all carrying those wooden Strike Anywhere kitchen matches. And I can tell you there have been many occasions where I have struck one match and used it to light my camp stove or used it to light whatever material I was going to light. Yes, I've started fires with one match many times. There's also been many times where I've pulled a match out of the waterproof match container, gone to strike it on this rough part of the container, and the head just crumbled off. There's been times where I've gone to strike it and the match broke in half, and the half with the head on it fell on the very wet ground. There's been times I've taken a match out of a waterproof match container and everything in the environment was so wet there was nothing to strike it on. So I try to strike it on another match and crumble the heads off both. The biggest culprit is wind. There's been many times I've tried to light something and the wind blows the match out before I can even get started and I end up trying to hold the stuff in my coat and light it <laughs> to keep it out of the wind. There's been a few times where it's taken me eight or nine matches to get a fire started. The idea that I only need to carry one is to me hubris. But a lot of people suffer from this because they think their skill level is far greater than it really is. And you'll see this when it comes to marksmanship, physical fitness, land navigation, the list goes on ad astra. There are people who will think that they're going to go into the field and they're not hunting or anything, they don't want to carry a rifle, but they're going to carry a handgun. So they'll carry a handgun like this Ruger Mark III, which depending on what you're doing can be an outstanding survival gun. And somebody will tell me about his plan is that he's going to carry a gun like that for the purpose of shooting small game like squirrels or rabbits or grouse or quail. And I don't mean shoot them out of the sky, actually in the state in which I reside, it is legal to hunt grouse with a 22 pistol. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Except I happen to know, and I'm not talking about the match guy anymore, I'm talking about somebody else. I happen to know that under good controlled range conditions at 25 yards, he can't hold a group any better than that. But he thinks at that distance, he's gonna be able to hit a squirrel, 
he believes himself to have a skill level far greater than what his skill level really is. Now, this also comes to things like reading a compass and land navigation. You'll see somebody with a compass like this, and they think they know how to operate it. Well, I'm out in the field, and without looking at my compass, I'll make the statement that, well, north is basically that way, and somebody will pull out their compass and look at it, and it tells them that north is that way, and they want to tell me about how wrong I am. Okay, problem is, he doesn't realize that as he's saying that way is north, he's pointing almost directly at the rising sun. Last I checked, the sun doesn't rise in the north. And so I have to explain to him, why don't you move your rifle away from your compass? Oh, so he does. And the needle goes over to the right direction. Because he thinks he knows how to operate the compass, but he's unaware that compasses are magnetic and they're attracted to ferrous metals. He's also so inobservant that he doesn't notice that he's looking at the rising sun. And he's so obtuse that he hasn't noticed the many, many times that I've looked at my compass like this to keep my rifle away from it. Thinking that you know how to do something that you just don't know how to do. Now, this also goes into people who believe themselves to have characteristics or talents or traits that they don't have. Such as, it gets to be about noon, and someone will say, let's go over to that hill a couple of miles away and climb it. No, I don't think we could do that and get back before dark. And then they make some grossly unrealistic statement like, it's only a couple of miles away, I could get there in half an hour. When I happen to know that he can't walk on flat level ground and cover two miles in half an hour, there's no way he's going to go through the field and do that. But he believes he can. <sighs> there's another subject I want to talk about. And when I discuss this, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Please, just let me get through this. There are certain people that have certain talents. Like the track and field athlete who can do long jump and actually jump 20 feet. <laughs> That's amazing. There are people that have certain talents. But... In the subject of wilderness survival, there's a lot of people who believe themselves to have talents that they don't have. There are a few people, in my experience, less than 1% of the population, who can walk outside and be outside for a minute or two and then estimate the ambient temperature. And when I'm talking about temperature, I'm talking about Fahrenheit. Estimate the temperature within a degree or two every time and be right just about every time. There are people that can do that. However, the other 99% of you can't. And there's another thing that people believe themselves to be able to do when it comes to land navigation. There are certain people, again, in my experience, less than 1% of us, can go to a place and because they're very observant and because they have good proprioception and because they keep track of how far they've gone and what direction they've gone, they can do land navigation extremely well. They can come out to a place like this and look around and say, yeah, north is about there and be right. Okay, there are some people that can do that. There was a time that we had to go to a place and there's a whole bunch of buildings in this area and we had to find the right building and we took care of whatever it was we were doing. Then a year later, we had to go back to the exact same place and I'm looking around, what building did we go to? And Brian says, was that one right there? Because he's observant like that and he can do things like that. The other 99% of us can't. Now, if you were to ask me right now, what direction is north? 
I can tell you that it's basically right about there. Now, there's reasons that I know that, and it has nothing to do with a sense of direction. It has to do with, I've been in this particular place often enough that I know where the sun comes up this time of year. And I also happen to know that the sun rises basically in the east and sets basically in the west, but it can vary off of that depending on what time of year it is. But as I'm filming this today, the first day of spring was not that long ago. And the first day of spring is one of two days in the year where the sun rises in the true east and sets in the true west. And since I know where that was, I can tell you about which way is north. And that has nothing to do with a sense of direction or anything else. It has to do with things I've learned over the years. If I were out here at night, provided that I could see some of the stars, I could still tell you which way is north because I know how to find the north star. Contrary to popular belief, it is not the brightest star in the sky. But because I know how to find it, I can tell you which way is north. There are certain people who think that they could walk blindfolded all over the place, spin them around a bunch of times, and they'll be able to tell you which way is north because they have a sense of direction. Well, as far as I know from the sources I've seen, pigeons have a sense of direction. But among humans, there's less than 1% that really have an uncanny ability to do land navigation, and the other 99% of us don't. But among people who consider themselves knowledgeable on wilderness survival, there's a lot of people who think that they do. Now, let me tell you another anecdote. Recently, I had a deck put on a house. Oh, side note. Paul Morgan out of Lincoln City, Oregon, he and his crew do remodeling, home repair, carpentry work. Outstanding. Okay, but to get back on task, Somebody comes over, they're looking at the deck, and I said, that's really nice. And then he tells me that I should cut down those trees on the other side of the yard. Okay. And he explains that if I cut down those trees, I'd have a good view of the ocean. No, that's north. The ocean's over there. And he actually argues the point with me for a minute or two. No, the ocean's over there. You don't have a sense of direction. Now, there's a mistake that people make when driving, and I've found that inexperienced drivers, younger people, make this mistake more often than more experienced drivers. And when you're on certain types of freeways in certain places, you can make this mistake a little more often, such as when you get on I-80 and you want to go east or west. There's certain places where the freeway, even though it's called 80 east or 80 west, is running almost north and south. And so you really need to go north, but you know it's I-80 west. Oh, no, it isn't. It was I-80 east. It's a mistake people make. I've certainly made it a couple of times. Well, one day I was talking to somebody, and I used that as an example of something or other, and I said, yeah, when you get on the freeway the wrong direction, we've all done that. And he tells me that he's never done that because, quote, I have a better sense of direction than that close quote. No, you don't. The belief that you have a talent or a trait that you don't have gets people in trouble all the time. And this goes from the ability to read a compass, the ability to operate machinery, overestimating your marksmanship skills overestimating your fire building skills, overestimating your land navigation skills, your level of physical fitness. The list goes on and on and on. And this is something that takes place in many facets of society, but it's something I see in people who consider themselves to be knowledgeable on the subject of wilderness survival more often than I see it anywhere else in life. So, with all of that, let's go to point two. So, point two. Point two is an extension of point one, and it's a two-parter. As where point one is thinking you have an ability that you don't have, point two A is thinking that a piece of equipment has an ability that it doesn't have. Point two B is failing to recognize the capabilities that your equipment does have. 
Put more simply, but less accurately, 2A is thinking a piece of gear can do something when it can't. 2B is thinking a piece of gear can't do something when it can. Multifaceted and gets a lot of people in trouble. And this can be anything from buying a coat with a nylon shell, going outside for a minute or two, and seeing the water bead on it, thinking it's waterproof, then taking it into the field and discovering the hard way that it isn't. It can be something like buying a sleeping bag that has a label that reads that it's rated down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. Then you take it camping when it's 20 degrees and you're really cold. Because the testing process didn't take into account realistic field conditions like wind and humidity. Or maybe the test subject had better resistance to cold than you do. Maybe he's from Juneau and you're from Jamaica. But finding out the hard way that no, your sleeping bag didn't keep you warm. Thinking that your boots are waterproof when they're not. And so on and so on and so forth. And probably the two biggest offenders of this are people's belief in their firearm and people's belief in their vehicle. There are people who think they can hit a target at a certain distance when they can't. And that's point one. But point two is thinking that their firearm can hit something at a certain distance when it really can't. Underestimating the amount of drop their firearm has at a distance because they overestimated its capabilities. And probably the worst offender of that is people's belief in the Taurus judge. And I do not get any pleasure from telling people that this is a really poor quality gun. Well, except that I do. But we fired this in part two. I don't need to demonstrate this again today, but there's a lot of people out there that think that this can replace your 30-30 rifle when it comes to deer hunting. There's people who think that this is a viable substitute for a genuine 410 shotgun. You're just going to shoot pigeons right out of the sky with it, which I won't say is impossible. I'll just say is implausible. But this goes on in many different ways. People's belief in their vehicles. You drive out in the middle of nowhere and you end up stranded because you thought your vehicle got 20 miles to the gallon when it really only gets 15. You thought that your four-wheel drive could get through that mud bog and then you find out the hard way that no, it can't. Let me tell you an anecdote. Very early one morning I get up, I have to go somewhere, I go outside and there's light rain, but feels like about 40 degrees. I'm not too worried. Well, then I get into my vehicle where I have controlled conditions and I can't feel the temperature anymore, drive about 10 miles and the temperature has changed. Now, once I merge onto the freeway, I start sliding around freezing rain. And the freeway is a nice, smooth, sleek sheet of ice. It's like driving on a hockey rink. So I'm going about 15 miles an hour, very light traffic, about then, I see in the side view mirror someone gaining on me very quickly. Now, I'm in the slow lane, and this person comes by me in the fast lane, going about 60 miles an hour in just a four-door sedan. Okay, well, they've got a lot of confidence in their vehicle. Well, as they get about 200 meters past me, and they're catching up with the vehicle in front of them, super four-door sedan has to step on the brake. The instant the brake lights come on, they come on and I start seeing the vehicle shimmying and then I see brake lights, headlights, brake lights, headlights, brake lights, headlights. And then I see the vehicle pinballing off of the cement barriers. Because somebody thought that their anti-lock brake system and their traction control and their all-wheel drive made the vehicle impervious to the problems of ice thinking the vehicle had a capability that it just didn't have. Now, no one was hurt, so evidently the seat belts worked okay, but you can see the problem with believing that your vehicle has capabilities that it doesn't have, believing that any piece of equipment has capabilities that it doesn't have. Now, 2B, failing to recognize the capabilities that your equipment does have. This can be because you're not familiar with it, because you haven't trained with it, Sometimes it's because you forgot that you had the piece of equipment with you. But for example, a long time ago when people had phones like this, I went into the garage, the door is shut, the other door shuts behind me, the overhead light doesn't work, 
there's no windows, it's really dark, and I dropped my keys. Okay, well I had the bright idea of whipping out my flip phone, the screen lights up, found my keys very easily. Okay, fast forward to this century, when I have a phone like this one, and one day I was in the dark, and I just pressed the button that lit up the screen, but it didn't give me enough light to actually do what I was trying to do. And later I'm telling somebody about this, and somebody tells me that I should have used the flashlight on my phone. But my phone doesn't have a... Well, if it has a flashlight, I'm not aware of it. Sure enough, somebody takes it. Yeah, there you go. Failing to recognize the capabilities that my piece of equipment does have. Most phones also have compasses and calculators and the list goes on. Sometimes you fail to use your equipment to its full potential because you have all this gear and you just forgot that you had a particular piece of equipment with you. Let me tell you another anecdote. I go out to the pond to go duck hunting and I'm with the same guy that only needed one match. And we sit there, and we sit there, and we sit there, and we don't see anything. And after a while, he says something to the effect of, we should have brought a duck call. I do have a duck call. I didn't bring it specifically to go duck hunting. I would bought it years before as some kind of gag or something. I don't even remember what. It had just been in my pocket for years. Oh, yeah. Let me pull this out of my coat pocket. And I pull out a duck call. And I make noise with it. And, yes, it did sound more like Burgess Meredith than a duck. But as soon as I make this duck call sound, he bursts out laughing, tells me what a doofus I am, and that's the stupidest duck call ever, and there's no way that would ever attract a duck! <clears throat> duck probably wasn't the word I used at the moment but he got caught completely off guard because he thought that this piece of equipment wasn't capable of doing what it was supposed to do when evidently it was working quite well. So you see, failing to recognize the capability that a piece of equipment has, because he thought it didn't work, failing to recognize the capabilities that a piece of equipment has, because I forgot it, I had it with me. That was a routine that would have made Abbott and Costello jealous. But the bottom line here is, many people get in trouble because they think their equipment has capabilities that it doesn't have, or they fail to recognize the capabilities that their equipment does have. Point three. This includes a demonstration. I can only do it once. I have to do it in real time. I can't refilm this. You really are going to have to bear with me. Also, point three is something a lot of you have already gotten to. As where point one is, thinking you can do something that you can't, and point two A is thinking your gear can do something that it can't, and two B, thinking your gear can't do something when it can. The reason that a lot of people have the problems of point one and point two is because of point three. The failure to train, train with your gear, train under realistic field conditions, the failure to test your equipment. If the kid who thought he could spark his knife blade had ever gone into the field and tested that, he would have learned that it's far more difficult than he thought. And once he knew that, he would have been able to practice it and become better at it, or he would have had the option of abandoning that idea and just getting a waterproof match container and filling it with matches. If the people who think their Taurus Judge Revolver can do all these great things had ever gone to the range and put up realistic targets at realistic distances, they'd learn something about the capabilities and limitations of that firearm. The guy who thinks he can walk to the top of the hill in an unrealistic time, if he had ever put on a pack, gone out to a hiking trail that's actually measured, the distances are marked so it's a known distance, and timed himself, he would know how far he could walk in a given time. The failure to train and test your equipment. Now, that brings up a topic. C-O-G-H-L-A-N apostrophe S. Colins, Coglins, Coughlins, I really do not know how to pronounce that word. They make a lot of stuff, some of which is really good, some of which is not. Now this is their fire sticks. And it's a package of sticks like this, which are basically particle board that are held together with paraffin. 
inexpensive, easy to use, and they're waterproof. I know they're waterproof because the waterproof is written on the label and because I've tested them. I haven't tested every fire starter on the market, but I've tested a few. And of those I've tested, this one is possibly the best. In terms of bang for your buck, I'd say it's absolutely the best. But they have another product, same company, Coughlin's let's call it, they're fire starters. Now these are shorter than the fire sticks, but they appear to be the same product, except they have a nice big strike on box only match head on them. So if it's the same product, I'm going to presume that it's probably waterproof, but is that match head waterproof? Let's put it to the test. There's also the problem that even if that match head is waterproof, this chintzy cardboard box with the striker, and remember they're strike on box only, is not waterproof. You carry this in your pocket for a few hours out in a wet environment and it's going to be in not very good shape. And I'm just pouring water on it. This isn't hours of exposure. Okay, not bad, but the light breeze we have here just blew it out. That's important to know too. So it looks like if this is wet for a short time, it might still work. Now, in discussing things like the breeze, earlier I was talking about in the days when I carried Strike Anywhere wooden kitchen matches. They work well enough, but the biggest problem was the breeze blowing them out. There's times I'd have to get my tinder and put it in my coat with me and try to strike the match and get it in there and light it actually in my coat before the wind could blow the match out. Okay. One of the things that people talk about using as a fire starter, in addition to all these things, is just a candle. If you can get the candle lit, it'll burn for a long time. Yes, you can blow it out, but it's a little more resistant to being blown out than one of those wooden matches, and it'll burn long enough you can get it in the fire and get your fire lit. But then you have to take that candle back out of the fire, you have to stow it somewhere. So what some people will use is really little candles, like birthday cake candles. You know where I'm going. These can be useful. Well, a long time ago, I came up with the idea of practical joke relighting birthday cake candles. As long as I can get the thing lit, then if the breeze blows it out, it'll relight itself. Now, a long time ago when I came up with this idea, I thought it was a good idea, and I gotta say I still do. However, because at that time, getting to the store wasn't something I could do very easily, and at that time the two dollars that I paid for them was a fortune, I never tested them. I just stuck them in my gear, carried them in case of emergencies, never did have an emergency where I actually needed one. So although I thought it was a good idea hypothetically, I have never actually put it to the test. So let's put it to the test. I paid about two dollars for this package of trick birthday candles. Got them at Safeway a few days ago. And I won't light it with a match, I'll light it with my butane lighter. And the wind blew it out before I could really get it started. So let's do the old inside the coat trick. Okay, it's burning in there. And now it's burning. There is a light breeze, but it's still burning. <sighs> <sighs> oh. 
Okay, let's not hang our hats on the results of just one. Okay, it's burning. Now, it's interesting, in the past when I've seen these on birthday cakes, you can see a spark or two come off of them. It gives them away as relighting candles. I'm not seeing that here. <gasps> magic relight birthday candles. Well, that doesn't look very magical or relightable. Oh, there it's sparking a little bit. It has to burn for a while before the sparky stuff starts going. <sighs> and it relights. So what we're seeing here is... that you have to keep it burning for a while before it'll relight itself. But don't let it burn too long, then you get past the point where it'll relight itself. Are you kidding me? <sighs> okay, I'm going to have to call that about a 99% failure. Imagine if I had learned how poorly those worked on a cold, dark, windy, rainy night. That would have been no fun at all. You absolutely have to test your gear. And of course, some of those practical joke birthday candles work just fine, but you don't want to be in the middle of nowhere when you discover that the ones you bought were garbage. Okay. Point four on my list. On my top five tips for wilderness survival, point four was don't overpack. Well, on my top five mistakes people make, point four is overpacking. Carrying too much gear resulting in having no gear when you actually need it. Let me see if I can explain that. You go out deer hunting and you go set up a camp and then someone gets up in the morning and goes out on a particular route they're going to take to go hunting, and he carries his survival pack with him. And I'm not talking about the 50-pound nonsense pack that some people have and call their survival pack. I mean, he's carrying about 20 pounds of useful equipment, cold weather gear, extra socks, wet weather gear, food, water, and so forth. But after carrying that pack all day and walking for miles, he gets back to camp and decides carrying that pack was no fun. But instead of reorganizing, revamping it so the next day he's carrying seven or eight pounds. No, he just leaves the whole thing at camp, throws a few extra rounds in his pocket, calls it good. Then he doesn't have any gear when he needs it. You have to create a balance. On one extreme, you have no gear or you're the guy that only needs one match. On the other extreme, you have too much and leave it all back at camp. Carrying just a few of the right things is better than not carrying anything. For example, I carry this Swiss Army knife, and yes, I have skinned and gutted a deer with it. Not ideal, but it's better than nothing. And having the Swiss Army knife with me is a whole lot better than having this knife that I left back at camp. Also, you'll see people will carry like emergency space blankets or sleeping bags. Okay, here's a space bag. It's like a space blanket, but it's formed into a bag very useful. And having this with me is a whole lot better than having a nice, thick, heavy sleeping bag with Gore-Tex sleeping bag cover back at camp. As far as fire building materials, you have to carry gear commensurate with your level of knowledge and skill, but having this butane lighter in my pocket is a whole lot better than having this butane lighter back at camp. You have to have gear with you, and packing too much means you have none when you really need it. Now, point five, and I said I would save what I consider to be the worst mistake for last, and I have. This is not only a very big mistake, but it is the foundation on which many other mistakes are built. And that is through arrogance or naivety or even more so laziness, 
rationalizing that you don't really need any particular skill set, that you don't need any particular gear, living in denial that anything bad can happen to you. There are people who will go into the field thinking, I can't get lost. I can't fall down and hurt myself. There's no way that any bad person or, or vicious animals are going to do anything bad to me. That kind of denial gets people in trouble, and it gets those people's associates in trouble. Now, this might sound, as I go through it, similar to point one. It's actually, in many ways, the opposite. As where in point one, someone fools themselves into thinking they have a skill or a trait that they don't, this is where people fully realize that they don't have a skill or a trait, so they rationalize that that skill or trait isn't important because they're really too lazy to gear up or train themselves. As where in point one, the kid who thought he could spark his blade and make a fire, if he were to train and test, he'd discover that he couldn't really do that. In point five, it's somebody that knows full well that he has very poor fire building skills. So instead of training, training realistically, getting some education, Instead of what's doing second best, which would be carrying gear to compensate for his lack of fire building skills, gear like road flares or the giant cigarette lighter, what he does is because he's too lazy to do that, he convinces himself that fire building just isn't really an important skill in the field. He doesn't need to build a fire because he'll never get lost. He doesn't need to build a fire because, well, it's not really that cold out or his coat is adequate against the temperature. People like that often find out the hard way that their gear is not adequate against the weather they're going to face. I see this kind of thing manifesting itself all the time in many different ways. As we're in point one, we see the person who thinks they know how to use a compass, but doesn't. In point five, we see the person who knows full well he doesn't know how to use a compass, he doesn't know how to use a GPS, he doesn't have a compass or a GPS, but instead of obtaining those things and learning how to use them, because he's lazy, he rationalizes that he'll never really need those because he's not going to get lost, because he's not going very far, or he knows the area very well. When quite often those people don't know the area very well at all. Now there are two main ways that I see this manifest itself. One is in driving. There are some people who do not like to wear seat belts. They find them uncomfortable. The, the list of reasons goes on and on. They just don't like to wear seat belts. And when they do that, they're putting themselves at risk. But instead of being honest with themselves and with everybody else and saying, yeah, I know I'm putting myself at risk, but I hate wearing a seat belt. It's a risk I'm gonna take. No, they will lie to themselves and everyone else and rationalize that they don't need to wear a seatbelt because they're a good driver. Well, I might be a good driver, but the guy that ran the red light and T-boned me was not. Or they'll rationalize that, well, they're not driving very far, so they don't really need to wear a seatbelt. What could happen only a half mile from the house? This is a mentality that gets a lot of people in a lot of trouble. Now, the other place I see this manifested so often is in the commentary in this format. It's very common that I will compare two different types of ammo, or even more so, two different types of handguns. And I'll do, as part of that, an accuracy comparison. So I'll set up two targets, like 20 or 25 yards, and I'll shoot the two handguns side by side, and I'll compare the accuracy. And it has nothing to do with survival or lethal confrontations or law enforcement or self-defense or any of that. It's just comparing the accuracy, or at least comparing the accuracy I can achieve, with certain handguns. And when I do that, there is no shortage of angry hate mail from people telling me how terrible that comparison was and how unnecessary it was to shoot at 20 yards because, quote, you would never do that. Okay, that's really silly for two reasons. One, I'm not talking about lethal confrontations or anything else. I'm just comparing the accuracy. I have to compare it at that distance because if I compared the accuracy at five yards, both groups would be small enough. You wouldn't really see much difference. And two, telling me that I would never do that when I've actually been in a situation, and I just say this to make the point, I've been in a situation where 
someone fired at me from about a hundred yards away, and I had to shoot back with the only firearm I had at that moment, which was a handgun. So telling me that I would never do that is kind of silly. But this is the kind of thing we see a lot in the area of survival. The people who have inadequate skills, inadequate gear, and are too lazy to increase the level of those things, and so they rationalize that they don't need those things. The person who's complaining that the 20-yard accuracy test is silly is someone who knows very well that he has very poor marksmanship skills, so he's managed to convince himself that he'll never have to shoot anything more than five yards away. Now, what makes these people the biggest danger, not only to themselves, but to the rest of us, is that those people who choose to do the easy wrong thing instead of the difficult right thing don't like to be alone, and they often will try to shame other people into not being prepared. In part two, when I was talking about guns for wilderness survival, I mentioned that sometimes in the field, if you're with other people, you're going to have to carry your guns surreptitiously, and I'm going to use a technical term here, because there are people who think that guns are yucky. This is the kind of thing you have to deal with, is that people who rationalize and know they're rationalizing try to shame those of us who try to be prepared in some way. And there's been many occasions where people have bitched at me for my pack and bitched at me for the things in my pockets and bitched at me about the, the LBV. These kind of people are a danger to themselves and everyone around them. Now, I'm going to tell you an anecdote. And this is one of the saddest things I have ever seen. As a dental assistant, I'm required to keep a current CPR card. And what is very common if you work at a clinic that has a fair number of employees is that once a year, they'll get a local EMT who's certified to teach the class and he'll come to the clinic and we'll all stay after work and we'll all take the class. Well, at the clinic I was working at at a particular time, about midday I mentioned to the receptionist, oh yeah, we're all staying after work to take the class and she tells me that she's not. You're not going to stay for the class? She tells me, no, she doesn't need to take the class. She doesn't need to have that information. Okay, well, first of all, it's a free class to get information that's really useful. But she doesn't need it. Shortly after that, I found out that about four or five months before this class was to take place, there had been a big flood and her house was in a place where it wasn't flooded, but it became really isolated because of the flood. And on that particular day, her husband had a myocardial infarction and died before the EMTs could get there. She could have kept him alive if she'd known CPR. And even after that, she's sitting there telling me that she doesn't need to take the class. Are you fucking kidding me? No, that is exactly what happened. This kind of denial and laziness makes those kind of people not only a danger to themselves, but a danger to the rest of us. And that is the biggest mistake people make on the subject of wilderness survival.